So, what have I just done? Apparently, I crumpled this piece of paper and tried to straighten it again. But if you would ask the people in my research group, they would say, you've just changed the properties of this paper by giving it a structure. Now I hear you thinking, what a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but they are, they are so right. Because if you compare this to the original piece of paper, it actually bends under its own weight. But you can already see here that this crumbled piece of paper, this structured paper, doesn't. Now, nature actually plays the same trick with structure. And so, uh, in nature, what we, for instance, see is a, a, a structure that, um, a material that's called bamboo, and this bamboo is made from cellulose. And this cellulose is arranged in fibers, and if you look at the cross-section of bamboo, you actually see a lot of small holes that are, have the thickness of the size of a human hair. And so this structure actually makes the bamboo light, but also very stiff, and that's why it can grow high into the sky. Now, in my research group, we actually try to do the same things with materials and structure, but now we try to make materials that have properties that don't exist yet in nature. Now, this is not a, an example of such a material, this is just a normal piece of rubber, and if we compress this rubber, we horizontally compress it, you actually see that the walls are expanding outside. And this is typical, typical, typical for most of the materials we have in nature. But we can play a trick here with structure. Now we remove half of the material by just making simple holes. And now when we compress it, something interesting happens. So at some point, you suddenly see a pattern transformation, and you can see now that the walls are going inward. Now we can take this, this piece of material, this is very this, is, this piece of rubber is still very big, but now imagine that we make this at the same size of what we see in the bamboo. Then we really start to create new materials by designing their microstructure. Now, an important question here is, um, how actually do you design these materials? Where do you start? What do you want to make? And we're really trying to explore this space of possibilities. So here we use circular holes, but what if you tr use triangular or square holes? And what about the pattern you apply them in? And maybe you can even think about three dimensions. So the question here is where actually do we start this research and how, where do we start to think about this? Now actually origami is uh, a big inspiration for us because origami artists have played with structure already for centuries. So what you see here are a few geometries that were made by taking pieces of, of paper ribbon, folding it at certain locations, and actually assembling it together. They snap together, and this technique is called snapology and origami. But something happens when you start playing with them, when you start to feel them. And if you look at the orange model, you actually see that this piece is very stiff. But if you look at the blue model here, it's very flexible. And this just uh, comes out of the fact that we arrange the paper strips in a slightly different way. Now, what I mentioned we play with this, and this is actually an essential part in our research group. We actually want to build things like these origami models, and we want to get a feeling for them, play with them, to really understand how they behave. And so, when someone's coming to my group for an interview for a position, I always find arts and craft skills very important. So, of course, we have these paper models, we have these building blocks, and now the next step for us is to try to understand how they behave and how we can make them. So here we start actually from mathematical objects called polyhedra, and we can do a trick there where we start extruding the faces. And so through this technique, we can make these thin-walled structures. And so we have now a few building blocks, and the big question now is, how are we going to assemble these building blocks together? How are we going to use these building blocks to create a new type of material, a new type of structured material? All right. <laughs> so with a bit of math, <laughs> I'm going to skip this slide quickly. <laughs> All right. We determine, we can write a computer simulation, and we determine how we can put this polyhedra together. And we then take the, next, uh, the, the, the same step as before, we pull this polyhedra apart, and we actually extrude their faces to create a new type of structure for this material. 
So you can imagine now that this is one combination of polyhedra uh, that lead to a, a structured material, but there are many more uh, combinations that we can make this way, and our computer simulation actually does the trick for us. Now, of course, everything is nice uh, when you can make a computer simulation, but we also, again, want to experience this play, this, this experiments, this feeling. So do the materials behave the way they were supposed to when we actually make them in experiments? And we use simple tricks here, like cardboard and double-sided tape to actually make the structures. And so here we wanted to make a material that's actually flexible, like the blue cube I showed you before. And so now we can actually s deform this material, and there's actually exactly one way we can change the structure of this, of this material. And as I mentioned, we now have a computer simulation, so it pops out a lot of different combinations, like this one, which is similar to before, it can fold in one way, but actually much more compact than the, than the previous one. All right, well, maybe now actually we can go to, th to this sample you see over here, and I want to do a small experiment with you a very intelligent, intelligent um, um, experiment. And so this structure is interesting because it can, it can actually fold in a few different uh, ways. And so I'm going to walk here upstage, and actually this material can fold completely flat. So we combine a few of these flexibility, so it can fold completely flat, right? It reduces in volume 100 times. And now when in its flat state, it's actually very strong. So actually, maybe you already guessed what I'm going to do, we can just stand on it. Right? And now, importantly, um, someone worked, a student worked three weeks to make this sample, so... <laughs> 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 All right. And now, it just pops back to its original state, right? So this structure actually represents a new type of material that can fold and go completely flat and change its volume a hundred hundred times, a hundred fold. And so maybe you already get some ideas about possible applications where we can apply these, these materials. And I also have a, a, a few ideas. Um, and so, for example, if we take this material and shape it into a tube, this tube can fold completely flat. And so we, we could maybe use this as a stent, which is already a device used in a medical device that is, can actually be brought into our arteries, and wherever we want to improve our blood flow, we can actually expand um, uh, this stent. So maybe we can use this, ma this material for that. On a slightly larger scale, we might be able to make completely uh, um, deformable furniture. <laughs> right? And so hopefully we can finally make chairs that no longer break these foldable chairs. But we can even go bigger. We can even th think about the architecture scale. So here you see an uh, exhibit where I collaborated with uh, an architect, Chuck Hoberman, to see how big we can make these structures. And these are actually four meters high, and you can still deform them um, by hand. And maybe here you see the possibility of starting to make um, deployable houses for disaster relief, or maybe having structures that we can bring into space with us because they can collapse completely. And so I talk a lot about materials, um, but all you see here is basically a prototype of something that could become eventually a material. We really work on the design aspect. We try to understand how we can design it and how we can make new materials. But one thing we recently started, recently started is to explore how we can actually build these samples on a much smaller scale. So here we actually use a 3D printing technique where we, uh, at, the, at the micro scale, where we were able to create these structures. And this, is, this result is just a month old. Um, and so just for, for an idea about scale, on the right you see the thickness of a human hair. So really, by using these 3D printing techniques, you can go much smaller. Another thing we're working on is actually trying to make these materials smarter. So here you see a structure that can be controlled um, not by our hands, but actually by embedding uh, balloons that we can inflate uh, from a distance. And so we can apply the same technique um, uh, as before, so we can apply this pneumatic drive also to these larger structures, so to let's say we can apply this to the structured material, and really create materials that can autonomously adapt to their environment, or at least that's what we strive to do. And so imagine a house where uh, the walls um, will start to open up on a hot day to let in cool air, 
or maybe a roof that closes when it starts to rain. Or maybe we can even think about our own muscles. And so replace these um, sort of smart materials, so replace our uh, muscles with these smart materials. Or maybe even a complete heart. Maybe we can make a completely artificial heart. And so through play and through experiments, my group will continue building the materials of the future. So I invite you all to keep on playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs>